So uh, the question that I uh, was puzzled with initially is the following. Every cell of your body contains two meters of DNA, this much of DNA. And to pack it into 10 uh, micron nucleus is similar to packing a piece of 2,000 kilometers rope into a car. I'm not sure what the owner of this car was trying to achieve, but that, that, that is the problem. And the problem is not the fact that volume is not sufficient. Volume is sufficient because DNA is sick. But the problem is you have to operate with DNA, and the question is how to fight the, the catastrophic tangles that happen to any string that uh, you try to, to pack in, in your pocket or somewhere. Of course, this problem is known to people, and people know how to operate with it, and there are sophisticated machines to pack wires or to deal with threads and so on. Do we need sophisticated machinery like that in the case of DNA? Viruses operate with their DNA in pretty much the same way as sewing machine operates with its thread. It's, it's ordered like this. But if you look, if you compare the scale of the problem for viruses, which is characterized by the following number, take genome lens, the lens of DNA, and divided by the lens of the domain where your DNA is supposed to be stored, then for the virus it is a big number. But for us, it is a much bigger number. So bacteria is somewhere somewhat intermediate level, and there is a large amount of knowledge about what happens to DNA in bacteria, and in particular about the role of these plectonemes in, in, in bacterial DNA. Probably in our DNA it also plays a role, but it's not known to us, and I will not be speaking about it. Therefore, I will speak about the guys starting from yeast and duck, and I will be uh, actually discussing the problem how to protect our DNA from this catastrophic result. This is actually the picture taken when people were trying to clean the place left after drying out of some water reservoir where fishermen left their fishing lines. And this is what happens to, to the very long DNA if you operate with it not carefully enough. So how do we do it? How does cell do it? As a reminder, uh, here are the pictures which essentially were known 150 years ago or so. Uh, and those are drawings by Walter Fleming himself, and I like to show this drawing because it shows how people were able to address these questions of organization inside, uh, inside the nucleus even before even PDF files were available. <laughs> uh, so what is known about organization of DNA in uh, complicated cells? It is believed that DNA is organized in sort of hierarchical fashion. Uh, double helical <coughs> DNA forms loops around the particles called nucleosomes. And essentially, what happens is this so-called 10 nanometer fiber <coughs> represents a new renormalized polymer. Well, I will be speaking about genome folding. I will not speak about folding of DNA because I know that the DNA forms these nucleosomes, but I will speak about uh, this 10 nanometer fiber. There is also a so-called certain nanometer fiber, and let me factor away this whole issue of certain nanometer fiber by citing this paper which says what happened to certain nanometer fiber. Essentially, it doesn't exist in uh, under reasonable circumstances, let me skip this uh, discussion for the sake of break. So what do we know about this particular point? What do we know about it? Uh, surprisingly little. And one physical parameter that is poorly understood about this 10 nanometer fiber is simply its density. Normally, the length of the polymer is measured in number of well, numbers. Let's see. And here 
you want to say that lens would be measured in number of base pairs of DNA. But how many base pairs of DNA are here per one uh, millimeter, centimeter, whatever, for per unit lens of this fundamental fiber is a poorly known number. It is usually estimated between 4 key and 120 key to, uh, uh, base pairs per nanometer, which is insufficient accuracy, as it turns out. Uh, it leads to very uncertain estimate of the important property, which is entanglement. We know from polymer physics how to estimate whether polymers are entangled or not, and it is characterized by entanglement lens introduced by the gem, and there is a whole machinery how to measure it, how to compute it, and so on, and based on this uncertainty, uh, we have uh, actually uh, uh, more than two orders of magnitude of uncertainty in terms of this uh, important part. So there is much to be learned, and we are making guesses in many cases. Keep in mind this when you listen to the rest of my talk. What are the major experimental observations regarding, <coughs> regarding this organization of chromosomes in the nucleus? I'm speaking here about interface nucleus, which means it is nucleus which is not pre being uh, divided, it is nucleus that leads the expressive genes, operates and so on. So it, all the uh, chromosomes are small and fluffy, small and boring. But what happens here is uh, Thomas Kramer and his co-workers, they were able to stain every chromosome in its own color and make a photograph, micro photograph, and you see that every chromosome occupies its own territory, its own chromosome territory. Uh, so it looks like geographical map of some country. I, used, I like to compare it to Swiss cantons, but it's a matter of taste. Uh, and uh, it is actually surprising. You all mentioned spaghetti, here is spaghetti. Uh, and you will see that my talk is largely about spaghetti. It's called, it's Superficially, it's about uh, uh, cell nucleus and all that, but mostly it's about spaghetti. <laughs> Trust me, there will be more spaghetti to fall. So here I put together spaghetti of uh, different kinds, and you see that they, of course, do not form any tape, so they do not separate. So why do chromosomes separate? It turns out that adaptation is the key. When the spaghetti separate, uh, mix, spaghetti mix, they mix because they dictate. Each spaghetti, while it, it, it hook, it moves along its own contour and its end, its end goes between loops of other spaghetti, which results in mixing. If you prohibit, uh, uh, if you prohibit dictation, then what you obtain is different spaghetti, and this is computationally generated spaghetti made by Kurt Kramer and his associates. And there are now several examples. In this case, spaghetti cannot rotate because they are made to be rings. Their ends are connected. But there are other ways to protect them from rotation, such as make a bulge at the end, or just make it too long to rotate. So in any case, in every case that we know of, whenever, whenever Reputation is suppressed from the very beginning, then you have this territorial structure, which is different from regular spaghetti, and this leads to hypothesis that territories, the observed territories, are due to topological fact, due to the fact that these polymers uh, are polymers with uh, suppressed reputation. So let's remember this statement and look at other group of experiments due mainly to this man, Job Decker, an uh, ingenious experimentalist. I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, wins the Nobel Prize for his experiments on, on chromosomes and their organization. And his main idea is a series of experiments which are called C, many C's, 3C, 5C, high C, and various. 
combinations and it is chromosome capture, confirmation capture, something. So this, it's a good thing to understand how this works, and this is easy to do. What happens is we have to imagine this ball of spaghetti, and you introduce it in the ball of spaghetti, you introduce cross -link. They do not cross in DNA, they cross in proteins, which are tightly associated with DNA. Doesn't matter, they are cross -link. Then you use uh, so-called restriction enzymes, which are molecular scissors, they chop DNA into pieces, and then what you do is you sequence the pieces which happen to be cross-linked. You sequence them, and then since you know the sequence of the whole genome, and your computer has in its memory the sequence of the whole genome, you can recognize, oh, this yellow part was here, and this blue part was there, and therefore, what I have observed in this particular three-dimensional organization of the system, these two pieces were next to each other. You collect this data, and you, first of all, you, or in this case, my student, who read many papers where this experiment was run on uh, various, these all papers uh, on various biological species, uh, you collect the data on uh, the probability that this piece and this piece are next to each other in space, being separated by a piece of polymer of the lens S, and there is this uncertainty due to the fact that we don't know linear density very accurately. But nevertheless, if you compare the data, you see that yeast and these other guys definitely belong to different groups. We can, of course, we should be proud that we belong to a higher group uh, than this. But apart from that, what can we learn from here? And uh, the first thing that you should realize is that all these guys, mouse, fruit fly, and human, they all have much longer genomes than yeast. Don't think they have long, we have longer genome than yeast because uh, we have more genes. It is not true. We have about the same number of genes, maybe 10 percent. The number of genes is the same, but in our case, most of the DNA, 99 percent of DNA, is non-coding DNA. So it's, it used to be called junk DNA. It's now not called junk anymore. We need to be doing something. It doesn't matter for me now. But the important point is that these guys have much longer DNA much longer genome. And my interpretation, therefore, of this data, of this discrepancy between these two groups, is that these guys do not obtain, and remember, if we suppress obtain, we obtain territories, so these guys do not obtain, and this guy can obtain, and therefore, it is very different behavior. So can we really quantitatively explain this data based on the idea that here reputation is possible and here reputation is not possible. So here I have several slides and I will uh, go through them very quickly because I don't have time to go through the technical details, but I will give you a flavor of what we do. So the whole next several slides, if you are tired of, of series speaking about their equations, Close your eyes and relax because the next few slides will be explanation how we attempt to explain this behavior when adaptation is suppressed, when adaptation is prohibited. So, simulation wise, we know that the species, we, in this case, this is a polymer which cannot adaptate, in this case, it cannot adaptate because it's a real. And it is in the sea of others which are the same as this one. And this one can rotate. It's a linear chain in the sea of other linear chains. So this one forms extended tube, and this one is collapsed. Now this is fundamental difference. Cannot rotate, can rotate. Uh, it turns out that you can actually have a master curve for different uh, cases of uh, no reputation polymers, their overall size, which is normalized here in a strange way, overall size as a function of their length, 
and the important lens is, is plotted, it forms a master curve. Uh, it is a non-trivial achievement to see this master curve because it is the master curve by dividing lens or entanglement lens. And I have to explain that entanglement lens was introduced by the gen as dynamical property. It enters uh, viscosity, let's say, of linear polymer map. And here it is introduced in, in characterizing of static property. And nevertheless, it is behind some static property. So there, there is something that we don't quite understand what is the nature of this entanglement lens. And this picture shows, I think, deep connection between different aspects. So apart from overall size of the object, which is uh, revealed by the fact that there are territories, no rectation, yes territories, no territories, yes rectation, something like this. So territories suggest that each of this, of this non-rectating polymers is governed by the critical exponent, size critical exponent once more. There are some other critical exponents. One, for instance, what is the surface roughness of this territory? Another is how this loop factor or contact probability decays with distance. I call this beta and I call this gamma. And for infinite systems, for a fractal, I can prove that beta plus gamma equals two, which means this gamma is close to one, Better must be close to one, which means surface must be very, very rough. And they are very rough, as you see in this picture. And there are also other interesting exponents, and I will not touch many of them, but I will mention minimal surface. If, if this is a ring, you can attach a, a soft film to it, and you can find the minimal surface attached to it, and you can ask what is the surface area of minimal surface. And there is this power x uh, <coughs> there. Uh, so this minimal surface is for rings which are squeezed inside between other rings look like this. And for un unconstrained rings they are much more extended surfaces. Uh, so it turns out that the area of this surface is linear, grows linearly with polymer chain lens, which means that this surface is like a tree. It's like a tree, you see all the branches, and this leads to the so-called annealed tree model, in which a 2D every ring polymer will be modeled like an annealed tree, and based on that you can make all sorts of predictions and they are actually uh, well supported by, uh, by data. But of course, this tree model is, a, is only a first approximation. You may want to know more because, of course, this, if, if you are talking about rings or any other system which cannot rectate. Even though it cannot rectate, it can take one loop and put it in, thread it inside other rings. It does not require adaptation, and the question is, how many threadings of this type we have? So here, are, from simulation, you see that different loops somewhat thread each other. The question is, how much do they thread? We try to analyze this question actively, and this is yet an open question, but recently uh, this question came uh, to the attention of mass media, surprisingly, because our Italian and British colleagues, they first made a publication threading dynamics of new polymers in a gel. Ah, and then, uh, this attracted zero attention of mass media, but then they made ring spaghetti, and they called it aneloni. And the ring spaghetti, you see that there is one ring spaghetti that penetrates that. And this led to an explosion of 
mass media reports of various sorts, which says physicists invented a horrible new pasta shape <laughs> for science. Right? And uh, there is the Russian information, I'm sure there is one in Hebrew too. Uh, so it, yeah. this shows to me how real science should be done, uh, which is why I want to show to you this movie. In this movie, is, I finish my story uh, of reputation and no reputation, and this movie will show to you spaghetti which do reputate, this one, and, and the ones which, would, which don't, and how they are different. Ah, so this one can reptate, therefore they form this uh, entangled, we cannot pull it out. Of course, if you would you were to add some olive oil, it would be better, but, <laughs> but apparently it's not an option for you. Uh, so this type of spaghetti will work better. And while we are watching this movie, I want to point out that in, in the talk about topological insulators this morning, uh, spaghettis were also mentioned as a topological pasta. Okay, so this one pull, pulls much, much better because it's not, it could not reptate while being cooked and therefore it remains second. You see there are territories. Uh, okay, so uh, to summarize, not only territories are explained, are explained by the fact that the system is protected from reptation, but also this, this discrepancy. Yeast can reptate and show this slope of minus three halves, which I can easily explain, and these other guys show another slope. Of course, these confirmation capture experiments by Job Decker, they contain much, much more information than just this uh, simple curve. They contain vast amount of information. This is the probability, the, this intensity of power, this is coordinate along the genome, this is coordinate along the genome, in this case of chromosome 14, and each point in this matrix, it, it is about 10 million by 10 million matrix, it's a lot of information, each point means how probable it is that these two points meet in space. So you see that there is a lot of information, and some of the information jumps to your eye. For instance, there is some checkerboard structure, which they call top these squares, they call topologically associated domains, cuts. This is a big splash in biophysics literature, and what is the meaning of it, I will not discuss here, but I want to emphasize that there is lots and lots of things to be done by statistical physics. For instance, let me mention the problem. Suppose that you have this map. It's measured. How many confirmations are there consistent with this map? In other words, what is the entropy associated? Suppose this map is fixed. How much entropy is left there? How many confirmations is left there? If it's only one, then it's, it's wonderful because it's uh, like the important okay, problem with this gigantic astronomical scale. But I doubt that this is only one. I doubt that this is entropy zero. It's probably much bigger. But nobody computed it, and there are many other questions like this which I will. Now let me switch gears completely. And so far I discussed how this thing is organized in space. But not only it is organized in space, it also moves. Uh, it moves, and therefore there is dynamics, and we want to know what is the dynamic. One way to look at the dynamics of genome inside the nucleus is to insert there a particular particle, or just label one particular piece of DNA, and in the classical work by uh, our chair, Yuval Garini, uh, the particles that are labeled is telomere, which is the end of chromosome, and it turns out that it undergoes a very strange motion. It is subdiffusion, which then later 
and, and time switches to normal diffusion, which is normal behavior for a polymeric system. I think I have about five minutes, right? That's good. Uh, yeah, I think I, fit, I started to do it. Yes, it's another five minutes. Uh, so it, it switches, it crosses over to normal diffusion, but normally in polymeric system that happens, cross over to normal diffusion happens when uh, you, your displacement is of the order of the whole polymer. And this is, of course, not the case here, because it's not the displacement of the order of the whole nucleus. It's nowhere near the So it is very puzzling observation. Even more puzzling observation, and probably related, is the fact that nucleus which is starved of ATP shows much lesser diffusion. Which brings me to another group of experiments by these people, the Dostkowitz and Timothy Richardson, where they were able to label many, many, many places in the nucleus, essentially almost all of the nucleosomes, and they measure domains in which velocity has certain particular direction. In these domains, color holds the direction of, of velocity. So we see that there are yellow, red, and so on domains. And surprisingly, these domains are not the same as chromosome territories. And this is the puzzle which I can explain which only shows that there is a disconnect at the moment between little understanding of structure that I discussed before and little understanding of dynamics which I am about to discuss right now. There is complete disconnect between these two. So, important point is of course this whole motion is active, it is ATP dependent. So, uh, therefore there are two issues. One issue is, based on our knowledge of spaghetti, non replicating polymers, territorial polymers, to study passive dynamics of this, of this issue. And we did that, and other people uh, mentioned here also did that, and there are conflicting opinions about this, and I will not discuss this in details. I will show to you some pictures where our theoretical predictions seem to be in agreement with simulations of these polymeric systems which don't rotate, but it's not the place to go into it in detail. I just am saying that there is this issue of passive dynamics of polymers which do not rotate. And this is not settled here. But there is another aspect which is active dynamics which is ATP driven. And uh, Robin Brunschmann, Scott Rabin, and Alexandra Zidowska recently published a paper where this issue is addressed based on linear response theory. So basically, the issue is, the main idea here is to realize that there are active sources of motion, active pumps of two, of two types. One is called a scalar source and it comes in the form of osmotic pressure of the system. You should imagine this ball of spaghetti and there is water inside and you should imagine that this spaghetti is on the ball, some chemical transformations and some pieces of spaghetti feel now better solvent than others and then they well, they have to bring more water in, there is motion of polymer with respect to solvent, and there is friction, and so on. So this is one source of uh, driving. And this drives longitudinal velocity in the surrounding field. There is another possibility, which is driving transverse velocity, which is called vector source. And this vector source is illustrated by the picture here when some enzymes, and it doesn't matter which kind of enzyme, they grab two pieces of DNA and pull them together. In any case, they exert force dipoles in the system. These force dipoles, in order to create macroscopic flow, 
they have to be orientationally ordered, like in pneumatic liquid crystal. It's not pneumatic, even pneumatic liquid crystal, they are dynamically ordered, or maybe they are ordered because of biological organization, we don't know, but they have effect if for some reason they are ordered. So now I, I have this whole equation about linear response theory based on these two types of sources, and I will, uh, I, this just tells you that longitudinal velocity is driven by active, so, uh, by scalar sources, transverse velocity by vector sources, so I skip all that, and I skip within these pieces, and I will show to you this picture. So this is a fluctuation spectrum shown uh, under different circumstances and systematically in all cases these dashed lines are spectra measured for cells which are starved. Starved is interpreted such that they don't have ATP, they are they are in dead, and therefore the only reason there are fluctuations is PT. There is still temperature, there are thermal excitations. So this uh, shows passive behavior. This is passive hydrodynamics. This is what, in an ideal world, we would, should be able to compute based on our real three models, based on our non-mutating polymer results. We are nowhere near this ideal goal, but ideally this dash lines is something that should come from the Now, continuous lines are for cells which are alive and well, which get plenty of ATP and which live well. And this is all as a function of wavelength. And we see that what happens is that small distances uh, below one micron, it's pretty much the same thing. They repeat each other, including some little bumps. So this is pretty much the same thing. While at large distances, there are some macroscopic motions which are driven, which are actively driven by ATP. This is what happens. This is observation. Our understanding of it is limited, but uh, that, that, that's what we know now. Uh, so what is, miss what is missing here? What is missing are, of course, there are many things which are missing, but the most important thing which is missing is the connect between different parts of my thought. There is this whole story about fractals and critical exponents for uh, for the ball of spaghetti, which doesn't rotate, which shows stator, which shows this and that and that. Uh, this is one sort of one stop. And then there is like opera. And then there is the ballet, which is this uh, coherent motion in the end, active coherent motion and so on. And I never understood why there is no connection between opera and ballet. I, as a child, I saw that. Uh, it would be much more informative if uh, these people were to dance and sing and to sing and dance. And this is something that we completely miss uh, at, this, uh, at this stage of this story. So with this, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge people who uh, work on these various parts of this project, uh, beautifully disconnected parts of this project, and people my friends with whom I have uh, privilege to discuss various aspects of it, and I want to thank you for attention.
Does it mean this next cell, does it uh, somehow correlate to the size of the, of the nucleus? Does it mean that it somehow, somehow all of these binding related to the membrane of the, the nucleus membrane? I want to emphasize that uh, in computer we make them read. But there is already uh, sufficient evidence to confirm that territories will occur in independently of rings. If, if you only prohibit repetition, for instance, if instead of being rings, you take your spaghetti and on each end of your spaghetti you attach a ball, then they cannot repetate, and this is the same story. So, the statement is for human cells, mouse cells, and similar cells, there is no repetition. And there are maybe several reasons why repetition is prohibited. The simplest is it's too long to repetate, because the estimate of repetition time for human chromosome is thousand years, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody in this audience uh, lives twice the years, uh, including me. Uh, so that is simplest, but also telomeres are likely to come from bulges, which also prohibit separation. So this is purely technical trick to, to study this no repeating point. But chromosomes are not repeating. Okay, thanks very much.